Editha by William Dean Howells. The air was thick with the war feeling, like the electricity of a storm which has not yet burst. Editha sat looking out into the hot spring afternoon with her lips parted and panting with the intensity of the question whether she could let him go. She had decided that she could not let him stay. When she saw him at the end of the still leafless avenue, making slowly up toward the house with his head down and his figure relaxed, she ran impatiently out of the veranda, out on the veranda to the edge of the steps and imperatively demanded greater haste of him with her will before she called out to called aloud to him. George! He had quickened his pace in mystical response to her mystical urgence before he could have heard her. Now he looked up and answered, Well, oh, how united we are, she exulted. And then he, she swooped down to the steps to him. What is it, she cried. It's war, he said. He pulled up he pulled her up to him and kissed her. She kissed him back intensely, but reverently as to their passion, and uttered from deep in her throat, How glorious! It's war, he repeated, without consenting to her sense of it. And she did not know what to think of to think at first. She never knew what to think of him. That made his mystery, his charm, all through their courtship which was contemporaneous with the growth of the war feeling. She had been puzzled by his want of seriousness about it. He seemed to despise it even more than he abhorred it. She could have understood his abhorring any sort of bloodshed that would have been a survival of his old life when he thought he would be a minister and before he changed and took up the law. But making light of a cause so high and noble seemed to show a want of earnestness at the core of his being. Not but that she felt herself able to cope with a congenial defect of that sort and make his love for her save him from himself. Now, perhaps the miracle was already wrought in him. In the presence of the tremendous fact that he announced all triviality, triviality seemed to have gone out of him. She felt, she began to feel that he sank down on the top step and wiped his forehead with her handkerchief while she poured out upon him her question of the origin and authenticity of his news. All the while in her duplex emotioning, she was aware that now at the very beginning, she must put a guard upon herself against urging him by any word or act to take part that her whole soul willed him to take for the comp for the completion of her ideal of him. She was neat, nearly perfect as he was, and he must be allowed to perfect himself. But he was pecu peculiar, and he might very well be reasoned out of his peculiarity before her reasoning went her emotioning. Her nature, pulling upon his nature, her womanhood upon his manhood, Without her knowing the means she was using to the end, she was willing. She had always supposed that the man who won her would have done something to win her. She did not know that, but something. I mean, she did not know what, but something. George Gerson had simply asked her for her love on the way home from a concert. She gave her love to him without, as it were, thinking. But now it flashed upon her and she could do nothing worthy to have won her. Be a hero, her hero. It would be even better than if he had done it before asking her. It would be grander. Besides, she had delivered in the war from the beginning. She had believed in the war from the beginning. But don't you see, dearest, she said, that it would have come to this if it, had, if it hadn't been in the order of providence? And I call any war glorious. That is for the liberation of people who have been struggling for years against the cruelest oppression. Don't you think? Don't you think so too? I suppose so. He returned languidly. But war is it glorious to break the peace of the world. 
that ignoble peace. It was no peace at all. With that crime and shame at our very gates, she was conscious of parroting the current phrases of the newspaper. But it was no time to pick and choose her words. She must sacrifice anything to the high ideal she had for him. And after a good deal of rapid argument, she ended with a climax. But now it doesn't matter about how or why, since the war has come, all that is gone. There are no two sides anymore. There is nothing now but our country. He sat with his eyes closed and his head linked back against the veranda. And he said with a vague smile, as if mo musing aloud, A country, right or wrong? Yes, right or wrong, she returned fervently. I'll go and get you some lemonade. She rose, wrestling and whisked away. When she came back with two small glasses of platted liquid on a tray and the ice clucking in them, he still sat as she left him. And she said as if there had been no interruption, but there is no question of wrong in this case. I call it a sacred war, a war for liberty and humanity, if there ever was one. And I know you will see it just as I do yet. He took down the half lemonade at a gulp. And he answered as he set the glass down. I know you always have the highest ideal. When I differ from you, I ought to doubt myself. A generous sob rose in Edith's throat for the humility of a man. So very neat, nearly perfect. Who was willing to put himself below her. Below her. Besides, she felt more subliminally that he was never so near slipping through her fingers as when he took that meek, took that meek way. You shall not say that. Only for once I happen to be right. She seized his hand in her two hands and poured her soul from her eyes into his. Don't you think so? She entreated him. He released his hand and drank the rest of his lemonade. She added, have mine too. But he shook his head in answer. No, I have no business to think so, unless I act so too. Her heart stopped the beat before it pulsed on with leaps that she felt felt in her neck. She had noticed that strange thing in men. They seemed to feel bound to do what they believed, and not a thing, not think a thing was finished when they said it, as girls did. She knew what was in his mind, but she pretended not, and she said. Oh, I'm not sure. And then she fought and then faltered. She went on as if to himself without apparently heeding her. There's only one way of proving one's faith in a thing like this. She could not say that she understood, but she did understand. He went on again. If I believe, if I felt as you do about this war, do you wish me to feel as you do? Now she was really not so now she was really not sure. So she said, George, I don't know what you mean. He seemed to muse away from her as before. There is a sort of fascination in it. I suppose that at the bottom of his heart, every man would like at times to have his courage tested. To see how you, he would act. How can you talk in that ghastly way? It is rather morbid. Still, that is, that's what it comes to. Unless you're swept away by ambition or driven by conviction. I haven't the conviction or the ambition. And the other thing is what comes to with me. I ought to have been, been a preacher. After all, then I could have asked it. I couldn't have asked it of myself as I must. Now I'm a lawyer. And if you believe it's a holy war, Edith. He suddenly addressed her. Oh, I know you do. Wait, or I know you do. But you wish me to believe it too. Believe it so too? She hardly knew whether he was mocking or not. In an ironical way, she had always had with her plainer mind. Plainer mind. But the only thing was to be outspoken with him. George. I wish you to believe whatever you think is true at any and every cost. If I've tried to talk you into anything, I'll take it back. Oh, I know that, Edith. Edith. I know how sincere you are and how I wish 
I had your undoubting spirit. I'll think it over. I like to believe as you do. But I don't. Now I don't indeed. It isn't this war alone. Though it seems peculiarly wanton and needless. But it's every war. So stupid. It makes me sick. Why shouldn't this thing have been settled reasonably? Because. She said very throatily again. God meant it to be war. You think it was God? Yes, I suppose that is what people will say. Do you think it would have been war if God hadn't meant it? I don't know. Sometimes it seems as if God had put this world into men's keeping to work work it as they please. Now, George, that's, that is blasphemy. Well, I won't blaspheme. I'll try to believe in your pocket providence, he said, and then he rose to go. Why don't you stay for dinner? Dinner at the at Balcom's works was at one one o'clock. I'll come back to supper if you'll let me. If you'll let me. Perhaps I shall bring you a convert. Well, may you come back on that condition. All right. If I don't come back, you'll understand. He went away without kissing her, and she felt it a suspension of their engagement. It all interested her intensely. She was undergoing a tre tremendous experience, and she was being equal to it. While she's still looking after him, her mother came out through one of the long windows onto the veranda with a cat-like softness and vagueness. Why didn't he stay to dinner? Because, because war has been declared, Edith pronounced without turning, without turning. Her mother said, oh my, and then said nothing more until she had sat down in one of the larger shaker chairs and rocked herself in some time. Then she closed whatever tactic message of thought there had been in her mind with the spoken words. Well, I hope he won't go. And I, and I hope he will, the girl said and confronted her mother with a stormily exultation that would have frightened any creature less unimpressionable than a cat. Her mother racked herself again in an interval of cogitation. What she arrived in then at in speech was, Well, I guess you've done a wicked thing, Edith Balcom. The girl said as she passed by, met as she passed indoors through the same window her mother had come out by, I haven't done anything yet. In her room, she put together all her letters and gifts from Gerson down to the withered petals of the first flowers he had offered with that timidity of his veil and that irony of his. And it's in the heart of the packet she enshrined her engagement ring, which she had restored to the pretty box he had brought it to her in. Then she sat down, if not calmly yet strongly and wrote, George, I understood when you left me, but I think we had better emphasize your meaning that if we cannot be one in everything we had been better be one in nothing so I'm sending these things for your keeping till you have made up your mind I shall always love you and therefore I shall never marry anyone else the man I must I must marry must love his country first and of all and be able to say to me I cannot love thee dear so much have I not honored I mean, loved I not honor more. There is no honor above America with me. In this great hour, there is no other honor. Your heart will make my words clear to you. I had never expected to say so much. But it has come upon me that I must say the utmost. Editha. She thought she had worded her letter, letter well. Worded in a way that could not be bettered. All that had been implied and nothing expressed. She had it ready to send with her packet. She had tied with red, white, and blue ribbon. Then it occurred to her that she was not just to him, that she was not giving him a fair chance. She, I mean, he had said he would go and think it over, and she was not waiting. She was pushing, threatening, compelling. That was not a woman's part. She must have him free, free, free.
she could not accept for her country or herself a forced sacrifice. In writing, her letter had satisfied the impulse from which it sprang. She could well afford to wait till he had thought it over. She put the packet in the letter by and rested serene in the consciousness of having done what is what was laid upon her by her love itself to do. And yet, use patience, mercy, justice. She had her reward. Gerson did not come to tea, but she had given him till morning. When late at night, there came from the village the sound of fuffle and drum with a tumult of voices and shouting, singing, and laughing. The noise grew nearer and nearer. It reached the street end of the avenue. There it silenced itself in one voice. The voice she knew best rose over the silence. It fell. The air was filled with cheers. The fife and drums struck her up. And the shouting, singing, and laughing again. But now retreating, and a single figure came hurrying up the avenue. She ran down to meet her lover and clung to him. He was very gay. And he put his arm around her with a, bo a boisterous laugh. Well, you must call me Captain now, or Cap. If you prefer, that's what the boys call me. Yes, we've had a meeting at the town hall and everybody has volunteered and they selected me for captain. And I'm going to the war, the big war, the glorious war, the holy war, ordained by the pocket providence that blesses butchery. Come along. Let's tell the whole family about it. Call them for from their downy beds, father, mother, Aunt Hitty, and all the folks. But when they mounted the veranda steps, he did not wait for a larger audience. He poured the story up, out upon Edith alone. There was a lot of speaking. And then some of the fools set up a shout for me. It was all going one way. And I thought it would be a good joke to sprinkle a little cold water on them. But you can't do that with a crowd that adores you. The first thing I knew, I was sprinkling hellfire on them. Cry havoc and let's slip the dogs of war. That was a style. Now that it was that hit it had come to the fight. There were no two parties. There was one country, and the thing was to fight the fight, to finish as quick as possible. I suggested volunteering then and there, and I wrote my name first on all the roster. Then they elected me. That's all. I wish I had some ice water. She left him walking up and down the veranda while she ran for the ice pitcher and the goblet. And when she came back, he was still walking up and down, shouting the story he had told her to her father and mother, who had come out more sketchily dressed than they commonly were by day. He drank the goblet after goblet of ice of the ice water without noticing who was giving it, and kept on talking and laughing through his talk wildly. wildly. It's astonishing, he said, how well the worst reason looks when you try to make it appear the better. Why, I believe I was the first convert to the war in that crowd tonight. I never thought I should like to kill a man, but now I shouldn't care when the smokeless powder lets you see the man drop that you kill. It's all for the country. What a thing it is to have the country, I mean, to have a country that can't be wrong. But if it is, is right anyway. Edith had a great vital thought and inspiration. She sat down the ice pitcher on the veranda floor and ran upstairs and got the letter she had written him. When at last he noisily bade her father and mother, well, good night. I forgot I woke you up. I shan't want any sleep myself. She followed him down the avenue to the gate. There, after whirling the whirling worlds, they seemed to fly away from her thoughts and refused to serve him serve them she made a last effort to solemnize the moment that seemed so crazy and pressed the letter she had written upon him what's this he said want me to mail it no no it's for you i wrote it after you went this morning keep it keep it and read it sometime she thought and then her inspiration came read it if you ever doubt what you've done or fear that I regret your having doing it. Read it after you start it. 
They strained each other in embraces that seemed ineffective as their words. And he kissed her face with quick, high breaths that were so unlike him that it made her feel as if she had lost her old lover and found a stranger in his place. The stranger said, what a glorious flower you are with your red hair and your blue eyes that look black now and your face with the color painted out by the white moonshine. Let me hold you under the chin to see whether I love blood, you tiger lily. Then he laughed, Garrison's laughed, and released her, scared and giddy. Within her willfulness, she had been frightened by a sense of subtler, sub, subtler force in him, mystically mastered as if she had never been before. She ran all the way back to the house and mounted the steps painting. Her father, her mother and father were talking of the great affair. Her mother said, One Mr. Garrison, in rather of an excited state of mind, didn't you think he acted curious? Well, for a man who had been, who'd just been elected captain and had to set him up for a whole company A, set him up for the whole of company A, her father chuckled back. What in the world do you mean, Mr. Balcom? Oh, there's Editha. She offered to follow the girl indoors. Don't come, mother, Editha called, vanishing. Miss Balcom remained to reproach her husband. I don't see much of anything to laugh at. Well, it's catching. Caught it from Garrison. I guess there won't be much of a war, and I guess Garrison don't think so either. The other fellows will back down as soon as they see we mean it. I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. I'm going back to bed myself. Garrison came again next afternoon, looking pale and rather sick, but quiet himself, even to his languid irony. I guess I'd better tell you, Editha, that I consecrated myself to your god of battles last night by pouring too many libations on him down my own throat. But I'm all right now. One has... To carry off this excitement somehow. Promise me, she commanded. Do you never touch it again? What? Not let the can cannon clink? Not let the soldier drink? Well, I promise. You don't belong to yourself now. You don't even belong to me. You belong to your country. And you have a sacred charge to keep yourself strong. And well for your country's sake. I've been thinking. Thinking all night. And all day long. You look as if you've been crying a little too. He said with his queer smile. That's all past. I've been thinking and worshiping you. Don't you suppose I know all that you've been through to come to this? I followed you every step from your old theories and opinions. Well, you've had a long road to hope. And I know you've come from this from the highest motives. Oh, there won't be much pettifogging to do to this cruel world is... And you haven't simply done it for my sake. I couldn't respect you if you had. Well, then we'll say I haven't. A man that hasn't gotten his own respect intact wants the respect of all other all the other people he can corner. But we won't go into that. I'm in for the thing now. And we've got to face our future. My idea is that this isn't going to be a very protracted struggle. We shall... Just scare the enemy to death before it comes to a fight at all. But we must provide contingencies at Editha. If anything happens to me... Oh, George! She clung to him, sobbing. I don't want you to feel foolishly bound to my memory. I should hate that. Where, what, wherever I happen to be. I am yours. For time and eternity. Time and eternity. She liked the, the words... They had satisfied her famine for phrases. Well, say eternity. That's all right. But time's another thing. And I'm talking about time. But there is something. My mother, if anything happens, she winced and laughed. You're not so... You're not the bold soldier girl of yesterday. Then he sobered. He sobered. If anything happens, I want you to help my mother out. She won't like my doing... Like my doing this thing. She brought me up to the 
war thinking a full thing as well as a bad thing. My father was in the Civil War. All through it, he lost his arm in it. She thrilled with the sense of the arm around her. What if that should be lost? He laughed as if dividing her. Oh, it doesn't run in the family as far as I know. Then he added gravely. He came home with misgivings about war and they grew on him. I guess he and mother agreed between that I was to be brought up in his final mind about it. And that was before my time. I only knew him from my mother's report of him and opinions. I don't know whether they were hers first, but they were hers last. This will be a blow to her. I shall have to write and tell her. He stopped and she asked, would you like for me to write? I mean, would you like me to write too, George? I don't believe that I would do. No, I'll do the writing. She'll understand a little if I say that I thought the way to minim minimize it was to make war on the largest possible scale at once. That I felt I must have been helping on the war somehow if I hadn't helped to keep it out, keep it from coming. And I knew I hadn't. When it came, I had no right to stay out of it. I had no right to stay out of it. Whether his sophistries satisfied him or not, they satisfied her. She clung to his breast and whispered with close eyes and quivering lips, Yes, yes, yes. But if anything should happen, you might go to her and see what you could do for her. You know, it's rather off. She can't leave her chair. Oh, if the ends of the earth, but nothing will happen. Nothing can. I, she felt herself lifted with his rising. And Gearson sang with his arm around her to her father. Well, we're off at once, Mr. Balcom. We're to be formally accepted at the chapel and then bunched up with the rest somehow and sent into a camp somewhere and got to the front as soon as possible. We all want to be in the van, of course. We're the first company to report to the governor. I came to tell Aditha, but I hadn't got round to it. She saw him again for a moment at the capital, capital in the station, just before the train started southward with his regiment. He looked well in his uniform, very soldierly, and somehow girlish too, with his clean-shaven face and slim figure. The manly eyes and the strong voice satisfied her, and his preoccupation with some unexpected details of duty flattered her. Other girls were weeping and bemoaning themselves, but she felt a sort of noble distinction in the, in the abstraction. The almost unconsciousness with which they parted. Only at the last moment did he said, don't forget my mother. It may be such a walkover as I supposed. And he laughed at the notion. He waved his hand to her and the train moved off. 